Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce Dr. Jason Smith, who attended Wright State University before uh, attending medical school at Ohio State, where he also did his residency in general surgery fellowship in trauma critical care surgery before we recruited him to the University of Louisville, where he picked up a couple of more degrees and after joining the faculty, a PhD in physiology, uh, MBA from Indiana University, uh, rose through the ranks to become full professor, chief of the division of general surgery, and now chief medical officer for University of Louisville Health. Uh, Dr. Smith has been involved in innovative uh, translational research involving direct peritoneal resuscitation, among other things, and microcirculation related to shock and trauma. Uh, he has an active laboratory. He's a uh, practicing trauma surgeon and uh, outstanding educator. And I think you'll see why here in just a minute. He's had many national leadership positions, including the, he's the current president elect of the Eastern Association for Surgery of Trauma. And uh, Dr. Smith's gonna talk to us today about the future of healthcare and the shortages you can expect. Dr. Smith, thank you for all that you do, and uh, especially for giving grand rounds this morning, and uh, a warm welcome to our applicants for general surgery residency. You'll see here why, why in a short time, why this is a great place to train to be a general surgeon. All right, well, thank you all, and good morning. So, um, First thing I'll tell you is I have no disclosures. This is not one of my uh, talks where we have to worry about disclosures. Uh, if I could find some way to get some more of those, I'll work on that. Um, so as part of what we're trying to do and trying to get more information to you all about the medicine and the business around healthcare, one of the things that come up and that I keep getting asked questions about really now when you talk about the development of healthcare systems is what does it look like? How, are we, how have we changed? What has happened and how are we gonna change in the future? Uh, for all of those that are joining us from, from uh, outside of Louisville, I always put this slide in when I give talks around nationally to look at some of the things that were going on in Louisville. Uh, you can see the river boats and, and uh, obviously the Bourbon, Muhammad Ali and Churchill Downs. Uh, I also say that I came here 15 years ago thinking I'd stay a few years and see what happened. And that was 15 years ago and you can see what happened. So I stayed here, it's a, it's a great place to be. Um, this is the new hospital. For those of us that haven't seen that picture, I try and show that picture every time I go someplace to say that, yes, that is true. Uh, the shaking for the pylons that you feel from time to time uh, will be in case, uh, will be for this. And, you know, we are going to have some steel going up here shortly. Um, and this is the reason for that topic. When we talk about the expansion of University Hospital and us building the hospital down south, you already are in a healthcare shortage. And the first thing I get asked by everybody is how in the world are you gonna staff that? You can't staff your current hospital. What, what are you gonna do? We're, we're short of everything. And that's a good question. And I think that's something that we have to answer. The other side of this is, um, for those that don't know or don't remember, I wrote an article for the newspaper here in Louisville about healthcare shortages and why we had such a shortage in nursing. That got picked up and the next thing we know, we're on 60 Minutes. And I, learned a couple things. Number one, that 60 Minutes still existed, which I had no idea that that was the case. Um, and two, when I go around the country, you'd be surprised at the number of people that still watch 60 Minutes after football on Sundays. Um, and the simple fact, and we'll go through this, is that we had a pending problem that COVID simply jumped into hyperdrive. And what you see is something that would have happened over the course of five to 10 years, and it happened over the course of about 18 months because of the COVID pandemic, which has exacerbated everything. If you look at the cumulative change in healthcare system employment, you know we talk about the shortages we have around the hospitals, um, and we do have shortages and we'll get into those, but if you think it's difficult in the hospitals, you should simply look out into the extended care facilities that we deal with, the skilled nursing facilities, acute inpatient rehabs and other places. What you're seeing is, and because of the hospital resources, we've continued to increase the, the dollar amounts we're willing to pay for nurses and, and patient care associates and what have you. And that's simply shifting them from those less earning jobs and extended care facilities to the hospitals. 
That's caused us our own problems when you see our length of stay uh, for everyone uh, has crept up by about a day and a half over the past 12 months. And that's because the limited number of beds that we already had in Kentucky for extended care facilities outside of hospitals have shrunk to an even lower number because they're currently not staffed. And so when someone needs to go to a skilled nursing facility or an extended care facility or acute inpatient rehab, you're seeing that there's five to six people applying for every single bed in the state of Kentucky. And that's led to one of the problems we see in throughput through all the hospital systems, which is increasing the overall number of patients that we have and exacerbating the problems. The other side of this, and you have to realize that we were going to have a difficult time managing and taking care of the aging population in the United States really over the next 20 to 40 years. If you look at the number of people that are going to be over the age of 65 by 2060, uh, it'll be almost 15 to 18 percent of the U.S. population. You compare that to where it is currently, which is around 3 to 5 percent of the U.S. population. And that is the simple aging of the baby boomers and the, the early Gen Xers that we had. And that is coming no matter what we do. And, and we've known that. I mean, it's not a surprise. You've known that for 65 years, but, but it is something that is on the horizon that's going to exacerbate the problems that we talk about. And then finally, the healthcare shortages, and this is even before we got into COVID, health care shortages were a problem. Uh, this was in 2021. It said four or five healthcare workers say they've been affected by shortages. I, I would be like to find that one person and find out where they're working because um, either they're new to this system or they hadn't seen it because no one has not been affected by health care shortages in this period of time. Um, it is causing a lot of difficulties, and it causes a lot of work in the supply chain, which we'll talk through. But it also causes difficulties at bedside when you're trying to train multiple different people to use different products, uh, and you're already short on staff, and you've got rotators and what have you. And it's also pharmaceuticals. And again, this is shortages across the board, but uh, if you look at our own healthcare system, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about this, we're averaging somewhere around 1,000 different back orders and shortages in our healthcare system a day. If you compare that to 2018, it was 100. So it's 10 times the amount of shortages that we've seen simply over the last you know, few years. And it's all because of this. You know, we had a difficult time previously, and we were starting to reach a breaking point, but it was coming at a time and at a rate in which allowed us to do things about it. You know, you could say, hey, I've got a three-year plan, a five-year plan, I'm going to do this or do that. And again, a disaster happens, you're not quite prepared for it, and you then have to flex to figure it out. And to be honest with you, the U.S. healthcare system in general did very well in trying to flex and manage COVID during the pandemic. The problem occurs is that the repercussions of the ways they were doing that led to a lot of difficulties downstream. So we're going to narrow the discussion a little bit after that general background. We could talk about a lot of different things, but we're going to really talk about three things today. I'm going to talk about human capital, the people, the staffing, and the organizations. We're going to talk about the supply chain and what's going on in that supply chain, how that has changed, and what happens in the hospital systems. And finally, I'll talk a little bit separately about pharmaceuticals and what's different about them than regular supply chain. Um, there's a lot of similarities, and at the, you know, as we get into the second part of the lecture, I'll narrow it even further when we start talking about how do we fix this. Because in the important part of what, you know, as I present a problem to you today, you know, the people sitting in this room and the students that are on here today are the people that are going to have to fix this. And, you know, I would love to tell you it's going to be me or it's going to be Dr. McMaster's, but this is going to go on for a longer period of time. And it's going to be the nimbleness of the people in front of you that are going to make the difference and how does it, this plays out really over the next 10 to 20 years. So let's start with people and staffing. So, this came out of the American Nursing Association, and they were looking at the number of nurses needed to, to treat the aging population in the United States, and they figured out that by 2020, they'd be missing 1.1 million nurses, and that was in 2017. Suddenly, the pandemic hits, and we see, uh-oh, we've got a real problem, because when you look at what was going on around the world, not just around the United States, what you saw was is that the U.S., while this is a problem, not the only place where we've got a nursing shortage. We need more nurses in, in Australia, Canada, Germany, you name it, across the board. So you suddenly thought what might this be a national phenomenon is not. 
What actually is occurring is a phenomenon around the world where we had a dearth of nurses being able to care for those patients. This is looking at supply and demand over a 20 year time period. You can see in 2020 when we first realized that there was gonna be a gap, uh, what we saw was is a relatively stagnant supply of nurses. And you can see that line between, 20, uh, for between 2000 and about 2010 is stable. Um, particularly from the supply standpoint, because we didn't change what we were doing in nursing education. We were keeping the same number coming in and going out. And you looked at the overall attrition of the nursing force, you realized that it was a relatively small turnover. But as the increase in the number of patients coming through over the age of 65 requiring care occurred, we will now see also an increase in the number of nurses retiring. And so that's where those lines diverge. And you can see that's the problem of about a million nurses short by 2020. The problem occurs is if you actually look what happened over the past few years, you can see that the aging population of those nurses is getting higher prior to that. And then you can look in the blue line here demonstrates the number of retirements versus the projected number of retirements in the United States during that period of time. So during COVID, you had a significant proportion of nurses that had 20, 30 years of experience at bedside care. Uh, they had put their time in. They could have retired at any time. The pandemic hits and they decide any time is today. And so what you saw was an exodus of the workforce of about eight to 10% of the workforce. And unfortunately it was the eight to 10% of the workforce that carried the most experience at bedside. So what we wound up doing was losing that experience. We, learned that we wound up losing the institutional memories that we had across most of the healthcare systems in the United States. And we replaced them with grads, which were flexible uh, and you can see that in, 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 in our own population of nurses, but you can also see that around the country, but didn't have the same ties to the institution that many others had, didn't have the same experience in that institution or the institutional memory, and didn't have the ability to, to kind of be able to foster that next generation of nursing care that was coming through. So how did we fix this? Well, we fixed this by an agency. Uh, for those that don't know, we have had travel nurses. Um, uh, I always tell the story, before we took over CHI, uh, or Kentucky One Health uh, here in Louisville, uh, we had no travel nurses in the in University Hospital, none, not one. We had gotten ourselves out. We hadn't had one in a year prior to taking over, and that was November of 2019. University Hospital had not. Um, I'll in a minute tell you uh, where we're at with our travel nursing, but to at least say is that's not the case any longer. And I will tell you, University Hospital was hit not disproportionate, but significantly by a retirement of nurses. We had a lot of nurses at University Hospital that had spent their entire career here at bedside, and they did a fantastic job. The people that have practiced here and seen this during that period of time saw it. But when it came down to COVID, they had decided that, look, I've given you 30, 40 years, it's time to be done. And so we saw all of this. The problem occurs now is that when I go into travel nursing, on average, a travel nurse will make about $100 an hour. Right? That's about, right now, give or take, $40 to $50 an hour more than, than most nurses average here at the hospital, including overtime and the like. The problem also occurs is that I, as a healthcare system, am paying $162 an hour. The nurse gets 100 and the nursing agency gets to keep $62. Now that is a significant difference because if you look back in, in January of 2019, the average amount that you would pay over and on top of what the nursing salary was for uh, a travel nurse was about 15%. So if I'm paying them $100, I'm paying about 115. And the travel nurse and the, and the like that were, they were organizing this would keep that to run the operations. That margin for them has gone up to 62%. And January of 2022. And again, this is a supply and demand problem. They can do this. They saw an opportunity to exploit, the, exploit this opportunity and they're doing it. But every dollar spent here is a dollar that's not going back into the healthcare system or into the care of the patients. It's being spent doing something else. And if you think this is only a nursing problem, it's not. Um, let's talk about physicians. Now I will tell you, I was, we were worried you look across time, you were worried physicians were going to see the same thing that you saw in nursing with a significant retirement of physicians during COVID. That actually did not happen. Um, we are still on a path, though, 
of having a significant number of physicians retire in the next 10 years with a relatively stable number coming out. The AAMC looked at this and the projections for 2034, this was done in, in 2018, and it's actually relatively still useful because we, again, we didn't see the huge outflux of, of physicians during COVID. You know, we're gonna be 100,000 physicians down, give or take, by 2034. Now that's across the board in lots of different specialties, but as we're sitting in this room, I will tell you that general surgery is one of those specialties that's going to be down physicians. And you think 100,000 physicians, that's not a million nurses, but the problem becomes that, uh, you know, for every physician accounts for somewhere between three and 5,000 patients. So if you're missing 100,000 physicians, that's 500,000 patients that we're not gonna see. And why is that? Well, here's one of the problems we talk about. If you can look at the total number of applicants versus the match, it's gradually gone up, but not to the extent needed to close that gap. And in particular, we've not changed our residency match positions really much until recently. Now, I'll touch base a little bit on that later, but it's not keeping pace with what we expect to see the retirement over the next 10 years. So you're gonna see another reduction in force in physicians as we move forward into the next you know, 10 to 15 years. And that's the tip of the iceberg because what I've talked about with nursing and physicians is happening in radiology techs, med techs, physical therapy. Uh, we've got uh, in the laboratory, I've got contract staff now at University Hospital and a Jewish hospital because we've got difficult times maintaining and getting the stock of med techs and laboratory techs in the healthcare organization. So everything that we say has occurred in different levels at different times, and overall we're facing a massive shortfall in the number of staff that we have to care for the patients that are coming through the front doors. So that's one. So let's talk about equipment. And I always say, this is how Toyota killed healthcare system. Now that's a joke, I will, you know, Toyota, um, I'll, just so everyone know, Toyota set, helped us set up our mass vaccination site, and they were fantastic partners in that. But what happened was, is that we took the business principles that were put together by Toyota and, and Ford and the like, this Lean Six Sigma, and brought them into healthcare. Now, I'm a, for those that don't know, I am a black belt in Lean Six Sigma. Uh, it's interesting, it, it's got its purposes, but you have to be careful in how it's applied and how you use it because it does certain things to you. Does anyone know who this is? I'm asking the younger crowd, right? This is Jack Welch. So if you look in the 1980s, Jack Welch took over of GE, and he was a huge proponent of Lean Six Sigma, and GE, it became almost a religion in General Electric. And they took and did every one of their processes in General Electric around Lean Six Sigma, reducing overhead, reducing the, the uh, variety of types of procedures they did and get everything down. And that worked, that really worked for him, really all the way through about 2000 when he left. And what you found was, is that once you took some of the simple things that really Lean Six Sigma and, and all that supply chain, Toyota production systems works on, and then you start applying it to things it doesn't quite work on, you didn't see near the benefit or a lot of the help that you would normally see with this. And after he left, GE has had a very rough course of it because of that very reason. It works up to a point, but then it doesn't work any longer and it works for very specific instances. And what we try and do is apply it to healthcare and we realize it's a difficult problem. And it's a difficult problem because you do something called just-in-time inventory management. We don't keep a lot of stuff in our warehouses, right? You, you, you keep some stuff and if you need it, you order it and you bring them in. And as long as the supply chain is working, everything is fine. Problem occurs is when the supply chain doesn't work, we can't actually get the stuff we need because we're not holding it any longer, right? So nurse at a bedside needs an IV solution. Fall over to the pharmacy, can I have an IV solution? Sure, here it is. Pharmacy then calls warehouse, we need more IV solutions. Okay, here it is, warehouse then orders it and you only keep a little bit on hand. And you can see where that would lead to problems because just in time is not resilient. Just in time works really well if you're making widgets and you've got time to spin up and spin down. And you can say, hey, I don't have my, my, my uh, thing to make the widgets. Let's just slow down a little bit until I get it. 
But that doesn't work in systems that require resiliency. But we have taken that system and put it into healthcare. And what we wonder is, is why did the supply chain fall apart? And the supply chain didn't fall apart. The supply chain worked just like we designed it to, but we designed it flawed, particularly when you look at healthcare. And you can look at the causes of shortages across the board. And, you know, there's, there's demand surge, which we saw. Uh, we'll talk about it, one of those uh, when we talk about it. I'll talk about N95s in a moment. But there's also capacity reduction. We didn't have people in factories during COVID to produce the things. And so when we couldn't do it, we couldn't produce it and sell it. Then we couldn't move it. And coordination failure means, hey, I can't get it into the ports. And so if I can't get it into the ports, I can't get it to the warehouse. I can't get it to the warehouse. I can't get it to you. And so all across the board, there were problems that occurred in just-in-time delivery systems, which we designed to be that way. And think about it from a vendor's perspective. So now they can't produce it, so I go and order it from someone else. Okay, so I fixed my problem, but now they don't have that money. Well, they've lost that sale, and so if they don't have that sale, they're not going to produce it, so they're going to lay someone off. And we exacerbate this upstream by saying, you can't make it, I'm going to worry, who can make it? And we wind up running back and forth and shutting down and changing the supply chains because they're not making the products that we need them to make. And this has played out even more in pharmaceuticals, and it's the very same problem. And the funny thing about this is, is in disaster management, you saw this happen in real time two years before the pandemic. So that is a beautiful picture of Hurricane Maria. Hurricane Maria was a horrible storm. Rolled through in 2018 into the Caribbean, decimated Puerto Rico, for those that don't remember. Absolutely inundated Puerto Rico with almost two feet of rain. Tidal surges were somewhere around 10 to 12 feet. It was a horrible disaster in Puerto Rico. And what did we see? Well, prior to 2018, Puerto Rico had diversified its economy and tried to entice folks to build businesses there. And one of the places that they focused in was healthcare. And if you look across the producers of health, uh, uh, of products in healthcare, what happened? Well, what happened was is that multiple pharmaceutical companies outsourced many of their operations or put those operations into Puerto Rico. And they were the only places they produced some of the things. And so if you'll look right in there, one of the things you'll see is Baxter. In the Western Hemisphere, there's one place in the entire Western Hemisphere that can produce 50 cc bags of normal saline. And it's a little factory right here uh, by Baxter. That's it. There's another one in China. Those are the only two places that happened. Now, if you say, well, that's 50 cc's. Ah, but 50 cc's is what we give all our medicines in. So if I'm going to give you an antibiotic or we're going to start a drip or we're going to do something like that, I need a 50 cc bag of saline. And in 2018, we saw the significant disruption of the supply chain around things like normal saline. We couldn't get it. So what did we wind up doing? Well, we wound up having to change our medications to push medications. Or we wound up putting something in 500 cc's or, or what have you. So you completely disrupted this because we developed a single place and a single point of failure within disaster management planning. This is a partial list of drugs that we did not have access to in September of 2018. And they're small things like normal saline, bicarb, Ativan, Epi. And you can see where the disruptions occur. This is the only place they were made in Puerto Rico, in the Western Hemisphere. The only place that would make many of these drugs was there. And so we didn't harden the supply chain. We didn't call, we didn't, weren't able to, to fix that problem. And this led to increased expenses. We talk about, you know, labor expenses being part of this, but there's increased expenses all around the hospital system. I currently pay more for pretty much everything we have well outside of what you'd expect for the inflation rate during this period of time, simply because of a limited supply and their ability to charge more. And again, all the expenses for these things erode the bottom line, which is eroding what we can provide for patient care. This is another one, CT dot. Now, this did not affect us because uh, we actually don't have GE, uh, we have Siemens, but it's affected multiple healthcare systems. The only place that made GE 
die for their CT scanners was just outside of, of, of Shanghai. And when you had medical lockdowns during COVID, it did not get produced. So then you couldn't get CT scans. And so there are multiple healthcare systems around the country that are rationing CT scans. Think about it. Someone comes in and I've got to figure out, can I scan their belly? Because I can only do five CT scans today because that's all the dye I have. To think that that was happening in the United States is crazy, but it was happening around the country. Here's the next one I'll tell you about, so you're all prepared, is plastic resins and medical grade plastics. Now, we don't use this very often, but I'll tell you right now that uh, University Hospital no longer has entry aortic balloon pumps. And it's not because we didn't make the balloon pumps themselves, it's because we couldn't get the, the manufacturer could not get the plastics to make the tray the balloon pumps come in. And the FDA won't allow them to send balloon pumps if it doesn't come in a sterile process tray. So we had to implement impella devices here at University Hospital, something we had not done because we don't really, we've got the heart hospital down the street. We don't really see the need for it. We were able to do it to the cost of $130,000 for the five or six balloon pumps that we have to put in at any given year. That's what we're managing and that's what we're wind up doing. And again, you talk about, you know, it used to be 50 to 100, now it's somewhere between 800 and 1,000 back orders at any given day, not knowing when they're gonna be produced and when you're going to get them. So great, I've made y'all feel wonderful this morning, right? But that's not just it. And I think what I am setting this and what you need to see is that they're a real problem, you know, and COVID has exacerbated those problems in ways we hadn't thought about and hadn't imagined during that time. But there's also opportunities. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but we've already begun to see some of the changes that we could make to fix these problems. You've already seen it around the country. We've seen it in our own healthcare system. And it's gonna take time and it's not gonna be easy. And some of the problems are not gonna be easy to fix, but they can be fixed. So when we narrow this down, and again, I pulled out pharmacy, we're really talking about two things, people and staffing and supply chains. I'm gonna lump pharmacy into supply chain because many of the things we're gonna talk about are going to be for both. So when we talk about supply chain, I know what you're saying. All right, let's just stockpile everything. I'm gonna hoard it and I won't be missing it. Right? So this is the nurse. I laugh. It sticks gloves or bandages up in the drop ceiling tiles so they, when they don't know they're going to get more. I mean, your room starts to look like this at any given time. Uh, I won't say whose office this might or might not be, but this starts to look like this. And there's a problem with that. Okay? So the problem with that is, is that everything that I store and I don't use, we lose. So I'm paying for it for sure but it may expire. I may not use it. Someone else could have used it and it's not gonna be used because it's sitting in my, in my uh, uh, warehouse. And what you're talking about is something called just-in-case system. So if I've got a just-in-time, I've got a just-in-case. And I said, this is the Titanic approaching an iceberg. And just-in-time, that iceberg's sticking out of the, the water. And just-in-case, I keep raising that water level. Doesn't change the iceberg, right? It may paper over the cracks, but it doesn't change the iceberg. You just can't see it now. And so therein lies the issue is what you have to figure out is how do we fix this? Well, luckily, smarter people than me wrote a very interesting 336 page uh, uh, government policy draft about this. So the National Institute of Engineering and Medicine actually came together uh, the National Academy of Sciences, excuse me, of, of uh, Engineering and Medicine came together to look at this very problem. And they produced this interesting way of, of, of looking at supply chain. Now, what I'll tell you is, uh, if you'd have spent 15 minutes in a, any disaster planning session, you could have come up with this document without having 336 pages on it. Because what they talk about is everything we talk about in disaster planning. Right? We talk about making sure that we can mitigate problems before we see them. We, we make sure that we are prepared. We plan our response and we talk about communication. That's disaster planning 101. But what we need to do is take a look at this and figure out what happened. So let's take the case of N95s. Ubiquitous N95s that we were all reprocessing and loving around the country for the last two years. 
Okay. So prior to COVID-19, about 50% of the world supplies of N95 came from China. Not surprisingly, they cost less than a dollar. Okay. At some points in time, I was paying up to $15 per mask during the pandemic to maintain our, our, our N95 supplies. Luckily here at the university, and, and, and we did not have a shortage. Uh, we did reprocess things, but we did not have a shortage of N95s. Um, 10 companies made it here domestically. Um, and at the start of it, we reported to be about 12 million N95s in the national stockpile, okay? And you're like, well, what's the national stockpile? Well, actually, one of the national stockpile for the entire country is actually here in Louisville. So for those that don't know, when you go over to the mega cavern and drive through, this is the lights this year as you drive through that underground cavern and look at it. They've upped their game. You should really go. This is what you talk about. But what actually the mega cavern is, is this. So that's not me standing on those piles, by the way. But this is actually a palletized supplies that were over in the mega cavern. Um, which is a national stockpile, which is currently a national stockpile for multiple different things around the country. There were ventilators over there that we shipped around. There were equipment for the CDC. This is actually palletized to go into a, a cargo plane over at UPS for managing. And we store this. And so we had about 12 million N95 masks in storage. Unfortunately, we needed right around 3 billion. So we were a little short on that. So, and we look at N95s and we look at this case, what we find is, okay, well, let's take a look at this. Preparedness, we already knew we ran short. We weren't quite prepared. We didn't quite have the stockpiles we thought we would need in a disaster. Okay, we failed that part of it, but what else could we do? Well, we could harden this and this, we could mitigate and diversify. And this is where you see reprocessing. So the idea is, okay, let's take something that's single use and let's figure out how we can use it more than once because it doesn't physically fall apart. We just have to make sure it's safe. And so now all of a sudden, instead of having a one use item, I've got a 20 use item. I've now hardened that, that product that I'm looking at. I can use it more than one time, which means I don't have to just toss it. I'm not continually consuming that, okay? We can reduce that by about 30 fold. We can reduce demand by about 30 fold by reprocessing. Also, when we talk about diversification, we can take a look at it. And at the time, if you remember, the U.S. government actually provided money to those 10 places that were making N95s to stay open, to do more, to run extra shifts, so that we had 10 suppliers within the borders of the United States providing N95s. All right, so I've diversified where I'm getting them from. I'm not trying to ship them all in from China. And I've also hardened that product so it's not, not a one-on-one -on -one usage, okay? What else can we do? Well, we can also talk about EUAs of using non-NIOSH approved uh, 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 N95s. Um, we were able to get different N95 companies built up. And so now what we've done is taken a look at our response. We've reduced our demand, we've increased our supply, and we're taking a look at outside areas to bring something in. So this is our response. So we've hardened it, we've got a response, we've made sure our, pre our preparedness is there, and the last thing is we need to talk about awareness. How do we communicate that? How do we monitor this? One of the things that came out of this actually is that, believe it or not, the National Strategic Stockpiles did not have an inventory management system. So if you think about, you know, how do you know what's in the caverns? Surprise, surprise, it was a piece of paper. And so they would go through sheets. When you would go over there, and I went over there during the pandemic and we're, we're, when we were looking for stuff, and you'd go over there and they say, oh, this is a, according to this, in, in Cavern 3, Bay 16, there are 140 ventilators. So you get on a golf cart and ride over there in the dark to figure out where it is. And you'd look at them and you'd be like, uh, those are gloves. Okay. So, and you'd, you'd go looking for these things. So, actually, UPS, um, prize here in Louisville was able to go in and kind of help catalog and do some of those things. But developing those type systems of communication so I can say I know what I have, I can then talk to the different agencies that need them or within my own organization, I know what's in the warehouse. And I can let University or Jewish or Marion Elizabeth or South or one of the other places know what I have. Allows us to figure out what we're going to do and communicate that back and forth. 
The great part about our response here in Louisville and what we were able to do is we were able to share back and forth between the healthcare organizations. We were very open about that. So if you were at Baptist or at Norton or at the VA, we wound up sharing equipment that we had and didn't have, ventilators and the like through the system because surges happened at different places at different times. And we were able to manage that. And it all happened based off of communication and analytics and transparency of what was going on in that process. So finally, preparedness is where we need to be at. So we've, we've done a lot of these other things, but now in the National Strategic Stockpile, we realize that any kind of upper respiratory viral illness, we're going to need more N95. So they began creating and stockpiling more of those in the purchasing plant. We quickly realized that the ventilators that they had were the disaster ventilators. If you've not seen them, they're ventilators that actually works off of tanks of gas. So they don't actually have to be plugged in, which is, was great if you don't have power. But what we actually needed was ventilators that we could plug in when we had power so we didn't have to run through the bottles of gas all the time. And so changing that stockpile and changing that readiness and keeping your eyes open on what you might actually need at different stages of a disaster. And this is the simple way of looking at it. You know, you could take a look at whatever you have or whatever you need and figure out, is it something I really need? I mean, are we talking about gloves, which, you know, I may like them this kind, but I could use others if I had to. Are we talking about things like epi, meaning if I don't have it, someone's going to die. And if it's that answer, if I don't have it, someone's going to die, then maybe I need to increase my physical inventory of that. Or maybe I need to plan ahead for if this supply chain breaks down, what do I do or how do I get that in and develop my contingencies around that. And so looking at that response, it's simple. It's figuring out, you know, what's the risk of that supply chain being disrupted? How, how badly do I need that thing? And figuring that out. So what about people and staffing? Well, you have to ask yourself a simple question. What are we going to do and how are we going to care for these patients that are coming in the front door? That's it. Now, these are our nurses. This is actually uh, the photo that we have at U of L Nursing Week. And, and, you know, ask yourself the question, if the nurses are the tip of that spear on the floors, how do we figure out how to care for those patients? Now, we talked about this, and this is the stark reality that we're, that we're seeing, is that you can look at that, that by 2034, under 18 and over 65 cross in 12 years. We will have more people over the age of 65 in this country than we do under the age of 18. And you can see in 1960 that pyramid that we had versus what we're seeing or projecting 100 years in the future, right, from that time, 2060, is you can see there's a significant bulk of patients coming through at that time. We know that's coming, 12 years. We know that's coming in 12 years. So this is not the answer, right? We cannot continue to do contract staffing. So U of L Health is on pace this fiscal year to spend $100 million in contract staffing. That is money out the door in contract staffing. Not budgeted, slight problem. As, as someone would say, $100 million, that starts to look like real money. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing you need to do is this. I will tell you, if you look across U of L Health, we don't have a hiring problem. There are lots of people that come in. What we have a problem is retention, right? We bring folks in, and part of this is our training environment. We bring folks in, we train them to do things, and then they go and decide to do travel nursing or something else. We've got to make this more attractive to stay here. We've got to find ways to keep them engaged and keep them on a career path to stay within our organization, be that nursing, be that uh, medical assisting, be that respiratory therapist, be that radiology technician. The other thing we need to look to at nursing is team-based care. We have spent two years coming up with plans on how we would care for more patients than we have nurses, right? I mean, Keith Miller and I sat with all the nursing people and sat down and actually went through this, figuring out how would we make nursing teams if we didn't have enough nurses to care for the patients in the hospital. It's time to start dusting off those plans because there's interesting things there. If the plan is, or the problem is, is we don't have enough nurses, then how do we figure out how to use what we currently have to a better ability? And one of those is team-based care models, right? Where you've got a nurse, or you've got a couple nurses, but you supplement them with other things, patient care associates, more of those. 
of LPNs at times to do other things. Uh, and then you take a larger group of patients with each one of those people having a defined role within that care. What you have to be careful of is not getting tasks that can't go to, uh, taking tasks away from nurses or physicians and giving them to unlicensed and untrained staff. You have to be careful of what you can and can't do. But there is a significant opportunity here, right? The other option is produce more of everything. Okay, well, we could produce more of everything, but you know, the slight problem with that is, is we've expanded nursing enrollment. And what we actually see is it's been relatively stable, even though we've got an increased number of spots. And we can't expand it to the way we want because we're lacking that, as I said, that experienced nurse who was there and oftentimes training them. So you just can't open the doors. The other thing you had, and one of the things they looked at in the American Nursing Association, if you look at that expanded cohort of students coming in, what you find is they have a higher attrition rate. They leave nursing school at a higher rate or they, they bail out or whatever you want to say. So the people that are coming in need a completely different set of support structures to get them through what, what is in front of them. So I always say it's, it's like medical school. If I just kick the doors open for medical school and let everybody in, the people that get into medical school would be absolutely fine. It's the people that wouldn't have normally got in that you're going to have to build support structures through to figure out how can I get them to where they need to be so that we're at the end of that schooling, we're producing the same product, not a lesser product, the same product. How do we make this an equitable system moving forward? What else can we do? Well. I always laugh. Artificial intelligence and technology. Uh, everyone who came through my door during the pandemic was telling me artificial intelligence was going to fix what's going on. Uh, remote patient monitoring, which I'll touch base on. Uh, we had AI sitters for a little while at Jewish Hospital. That failed spectacularly. <laughs> but there are opportunities for technology, and we, we have started to see some of these things. This is an actual look at time studies done for nurses, right? And we talk about care coordination and documentation. If you actually look at what nurses do, only about 20% of their time, 20 to 25% of their time, is actually spent doing something that only that nurse can do, right? Patient care activities, med administration, at any given time. The rest of it is other stuff that we've added onto their plates that they don't necessarily need to be doing. And so my question when we were looking at it is, why are they doing that? Particularly, if I'm going to increase their wages, I want them doing what I need them to do. I don't need them, you know, uh, uh, not doing that. How do I offload that? Well, team-based care is one of the ways you can, you can offload it. It's the same thing with physicians. When we talk about physicians, if I take a look at it, what do I need people doing? Well, what I don't need them doing is spending a massive amount of time in the AHR documenting after the fact. Well, we use scribes, or we find another way, use AI, natural language processing, machine learning. The one of the few things that actually is getting better from the technology perspective is the ability to speak into something and actually get the notes to look like you want them to look like. So how do I figure out ways of offloading all of these tasks that we have just hoisted on to physicians and nurses and physical therapists and the like and get them back into the care of the patient? One of the things that was really big during the pandemic is remote patient monitoring. And this is one of the ways that we talk about taking a look around this healthcare organization of one, I know patients are going to be increasing in number and two, how do I keep them out of my hospitals but still take care of them? And one of these ideas is, is okay, well, if I set up a remote patient monitoring, I can say, hey, you can stay home and we'll manage your chronic condition or we'll do a better job of taking care of this. Or if you do have an acute condition, how do I make sure that you get seen appropriately without having to come to the hospital? And the idea of can we develop a system that allows someone to age at home so that we're not coming into the hospital for multiple CHF exacerbations, COPD exacerbations, and we're using the hospital for things we actually need to use the hospital for, trauma, surgeries, things along those lines. And there's all kinds of different solutions that are out there for this. And I know what you're saying. You're like, okay, well, good luck. But we've done this already. So think about telehealth for a moment and think about where telehealth was. I will tell you that we had a telehealth program here at U of L uh, prior to the pandemic. I think a majority of hospital systems, if not the, all of them, had some form of telehealth before that. 
The problem was is we didn't deploy it appropriately. But all of a sudden, pandemic hits, we shut down the offices, and telehealth becomes a viable thing. People start wanting to do it. And getting the patients to be comfortable with telehealth. I will tell you, even now, somewhere around 18% or so of our visits are telehealth visits here at UofL Health. That was 2%, less than 2% prior to COVID. It got up to a high of around 35 to 40% for us during COVID actually. And so we've already done this and deployed this. And as the generations age and they get more and more used to being able to interact, it's identifying where can I intervene in an area where I don't need them physically in the hospital or in the office. I can give them the care they need, which is the most important thing. And I can also figure out when they need to come and see me in the hospital. Now, the great part about this is, is this, there's an answer to this. And there will be an answer to this. We will figure this out. The healthcare system in the United States always does. It won't be easy, but we will figure this out. The other part of this is, this is just an overview. You know, I've hit on a lot of different things. I went very quickly. And you can get into the topics on all of this. In any of these areas, you can come up with plans and ideas to change the way this works. And in the next 10 to 15 years, the healthcare systems are going to need that. They're going to need people to critically take a look at it. And the people that need to do it are the doctors, the nurses, the people that are at the patient's bedside. Because what we have to focus on is, I always laugh, it's not the IT solution, right? It's the patient solution. I need to figure out what I need to do to best care for those patients. And there's no one better qualified for that than the people that are online and the people sitting in this room. So be curious. If something's not working in the hospital, ask yourself why. Figure that out and don't just be like, oh, it's another shortage or oh, so-and-so is not here. Find out why. Learn, your, learn for yourself what the shortcomings are and help come up with those solutions because this is going to impact all of us really probably the end of my career, and definitely for all of your careers moving forward. So with that, I'm going to shut up. Thank you all very much, and I appreciate the time this morning. Thank you, Dr. Smith. That was a really fascinating talk uh, about uh, topics that we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about as surgeons generally. I know you do. Um, despite all of that, um, for the benefit of our guests who are online <laughs> virtually, somehow throughout this pandemic, at you, uh, despite the fact that uh, many health systems around the country have had to limit the number of available beds and the, the number of operating rooms that can be, uh, be functional uh, and have had shortages that have affected their ability to take care of patients, Somehow, you and the rest of the leadership at U of L Health, it's been my observation, have figured out a way for us to get our job done and keep all of our beds open and all of our operating rooms open. Uh, there are problems, there are issues, obviously, as you described, but uh, somehow you've managed to keep, keep us all uh, avail, uh, available to do the work that we need to do and accept the patients we need to accept. We never go on diversion for trauma and never have even through the pandemic and everybody comes here from all over the place when all the other hospitals are shut down. So I would applaud the UofL Health team and Dr. Smith for the job they've been able to do and ask for your comments. Yeah, I mean, uh, so we have, and I think that's a great part, as you said, UofL Health, we have not shut anything down. Um, uh, one week, I think I, I had to shut the operating rooms down for one week if you remember a couple years ago, that was the only thing that we shut down in the course of three years during the pandemic. Um, that was because of COVID. That patients. was because of COVID patients. And so yeah. we have not had, and, and we work a lot to not have those disruptions. And what I said in the meetings when we we're up there talking about how to figure this out, I said, it's, it's take it from the patient perspective. You know, obviously it's patients over profits and you have to figure out how to care for those, those people that come through the door. We are the safety net hospital for this entire side of the state in Southern Indiana. And so you can't, you can't change that. You know, I'll make a comment about, you know, the, the for-profit world. HCA released their, their quarterly statements, and in that meeting, HCA said, you know, two weeks ago that by the end of January, HCA would no longer be employing 
any contract staffing in any of their locations. So eight weeks. There's only one way to do that. The only way to do that in today's day and age is to shut down patient care. You have to shut down floors. You have to shut down beds if you're going to get rid of contract nursing. We've taken the opposite stance. Our stance is, is that we have to care for the patients. So it's more expensive and we're not going to see the, the, the profits and margins that we've always done. We'll have to deal with that and manage that. That is easier for us to manage than it is not to take care of the patients. And so it's all about the decisions you have to make as a healthcare organization to figure out what you need to do to, to, to be able to do that. And I also want to clarify for our guests as well that despite the $100 million price tag of contract labor that you described and the challenges, U of L Health has remained uh, financially successful and growing and building uh, and found a way to navigate through all this to still be able to, to make money that can be reinvested in the health system and in the School of Medicine and our research and teaching programs. Correct, we have. And I think, you know, that's, again, uh, we've, done, we've done well in managing the crisis. Um, and, you know, you can see at our expansion, we're, we're expanding at a time where most places are contracting. And that's fantastic for us. There's opportunity for us to be able to grow as long as we can maintain this. Questions for Dr. Smith, Dr. Franklin. Thanks for that great talk. Um, fall seven years are best. You know, a few decades, that was something a little different, though, that impacts all of us. And I'll, I'll ask, you know, just your thoughts or what people are talking about. I watched the 60 Minutes special. I thought it was, you know, great. Um, just increasing numbers of medical school slots or nursing slots is not the, it's part of the solution, but not the solution. Every business has noticed that Gen X and Gen Z, they don't particularly stay at the same job for a long time. And it's not all revenue based. In other words, they will raise if you stay. They don't do 30 year career like we have done at the same place. And how do we navigate that in the future to, to, to try and and I mean, that's a cultural mindset that, that people hop jobs every five years. I mean, what what are your thoughts on that? Because just people will be, will be hiring more 10 and 15 year nurses from other places <laughs> that when they're stealing our five year nurses or not. Yeah, so the, so the question was, um, you know, how do you manage uh, Gen Y, millennials and the like and how it's different than the uh, Gen X and baby boomers? Um, if you actually look at, at you know, millennials, uh, Gen Y and the like, what you can see um, is, and even Gen Z now, is, is one of the things that they look for in their careers making a difference. Now, I'll be the first person to say they have no idea what that means, but they want to make a difference. So I say, well, okay, you know, I'll show you a career that can make a tangible difference. It's healthcare. And so it's being able to say, hey, let me let me explain something to you. At the end of this day, you're gonna be able to not only point to a larger difference you've made in someone, but I can point to a specific person and tell you you've made a difference. And it's the same thing that brought all of us into, it's the same thing that brought us into medical school, it's the same thing that's been pre being, bringing people into nursing school all the time. We have to make sure that we get out to them that this is a career that healthcare is an area that can can absolutely be a fulfilling. It's well beyond what you get paid. The people that go into this world, the, the people that are in medicine and in surgery and in nursing and whatever, there's lots of careers you can go and make a lot more money with a lot fewer hours. But you do it, and we are here because of what we see and feel outside of what you get paid. And so it's for our job to figure out how do we how do we ground them and let them know that this is making a difference. And how do I fulfill them beyond, and you know, here's an extra $2 an hour. But you're completely correct. It's, it's, it's a different mindset, and it's a different way of tackling it. You have to engage, the, you have to engage a younger staff member different than I would have to engage with, with someone who's you know, baby boomer or my age. It's just, it's a different world, but it's something that we can do if we look across this, this healthcare system. Questions for Dr. Smith. Oh. 
we still importing nurses? Yeah, so the question was, are we still importing nurses overseas? Yes, we are. Yeah, so uh, Dr. Polk was asking about tuition remission. It actually has. Um, and if you look, it did exactly what we were looking for, is you were looking for nurses with a little more experience. So if you think about nursing in staff that have 10 to 12 years of experience um, or a little bit more, their kids may be in high school or getting ready to go to college, it helped bring that group of nurses back to us because we pay for you know, them their, and their, their kids to go to school. Yeah, so Dr. Polk's question is why can't we call the EHR failure um, because of all the time we've been doing it? A fantastic question. You know, I, there are good parts of the EHR. I mean, it, it's there are ways that make that are good. What we've done is we've just lumped so much stuff onto it um, that doesn't necessarily help us in patient care. It may help in billing. You know, I always say that the EHR is a fantastic billing software not necessarily a patient care software. And I think that's where, you know, we have to figure out how do we trim some of the fat off of that so that we're really using it for, for what we should be using it for patient care. One step, Yeah, so the, the the question was is you know how do you how do you deal with the siphoning of funds out of healthcare for other things besides patient care? Um, now, Dr. Paul, remember I'm partially a healthcare executive, so you have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, but um, you're completely correct. So, so you know, I do other talks when around business, and I talk about you know the the dollar. Every dollar that goes into the healthcare system is coming out of a patient's pocket. So the question becomes: What percentage of that dollar is actually spent on patient care versus going to something else? Be that insurance company profits. So look at Humana and Anthem and and the rest, and how they have turned record record profits over the past two years. Where does that money go? You look at healthcare systems and healthcare executives, you know, getting, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, Ascension, uh, the, the CEO of Ascension just made a significant amount of money. Um, it's a fantastic question. You know, I think, again, it's refocusing back on what we all talk about as the patient. And I think it's putting people in charge that understand that, you know, at the end of the day, there's a person that you're taking care of in a situation that is very difficult. So how do you make the lives of the people taking care of them and that patient's lives better with what you're putting into the system? And if it doesn't do that, then you have to ask yourself the hard question, why are you doing it? I would, uh... Yeah, the question was, is healthcare finances and are they limitless here in the United States? Um, they're not limitless. Uh, but I also think what you have to remember is that they lump a lot of stuff into healthcare that may or may not be healthcare. So, you know, you talk about pharmaceutical supply companies, you name it, and you talk about the percentage of the GT, GDP that's spent on that. It's not all patient care. And I think, again, it's we've lumped all kinds of things and made healthcare an industry versus a patient delivery and a, and a patient care delivery model. And so it's, again, reframing that and figuring out what is truly needed versus what is simply there because it's part of our economy moving forward? We're going to stop there. Nobody wants to talk about it. Is there a potential there to use some of the Yeah, so this, Dr. Polk was asking about the, the, uh, um, 
you know, getting lessons from from Britain and the like. There's a fantastic, again, again, I've got another lecture that's fantastic about comparative healthcare systems around the, and how you could take different pieces of, of different countries and what they do well and create a healthcare system, even here in the United States, that would work a little better. Uh, but it's all about taking the good pieces and, and, and changing things. And it's going to take an appetite to do that. And we might be getting there, which is the good news. All right. We're going to thank Dr. Smith for an outstanding grand round. We need to move on with our interview process. Thanks, Dr. Smith. Thank you.